Good morning, church. So good to see you. So good to see you online. Great to have you with us. If you can't be here in person, I'm fired up. I'll tell you what, I got a question for you. Have you ever walked around, just looked at the state of the world and say, what else could go wrong? <laughs> you ever had that? Have you ever had one of those days where you say, you know, is, what worse could happen? What else could happen? You ever have one of those? Yeah. By the way, never ask that. <laughs> you know what I'm talking about? Because the minute you say, what else could go wrong? Buckle up, buttercup, because something else can happen. Right? You don't have to look far. If you don't believe me, just ask this guy right here. All right? I'll give you a quarter if anyone knows this guy's name. Anybody know this guy's name? My quarter is safe. All right. This guy is Dylan McWilliams. Okay? Even though he's only been on the earth for 20 seasons, 20 years, he holds the distinction of being one of the rare few to have survived, wait for it, not one, not two, but three deadly animal attacks, okay? Three de the odds are like getting struck by lightning three times. And uh, did I mention all this was done within 40 months of each other, okay? This poor guy began his trifecta of animal attacks not quite four years ago. The first one, he was hiking in Moab, Utah. Anybody ever been to Utah? Yeah? I hear it's pretty. Evidently, they have massive rattlesnakes. And as he was rounding the corner, he didn't see one. And not only did it jump at him and bite him, it latched on. And it emptied the venom. And it brought him to death's door. In fact, for the next 48 hours, he hovered between life and death. He was so dangerously sick. He was telling the Honolulu Star newspaper about all this. Dylan's most recent bite, though, came during an early morning boogie boarding session off the coast of Kauai. He tells the Star paper that after something large knocked him off his board, he felt a searing pain in his leg. And when he looked down, he saw a massive tiger shark beside him. And he might say a lot of blood. So when the reporter says, what did you do in that moment? He says, I swam really fast for the shore. Then he said, but you know what? That's what scared me more because now I'm leaving a trail and I don't know where the shark is. And is he coming after me? He didn't know, but he made it. And as scary as that bite was, Dylan says the shark attack came only months after a giant black bear attacked him. Oh, it gets worse. It attacked him while camping in Colorado at a summer camp in his tent asleep in his sleeping bag. He shares this story with People magazines. I know, you think you have it bad? <laughs> Just, he says, I woke up to a loud crunching sound, and I remember, gee, I'm in a lot of pain. And then suddenly I was being drugged across the campground by my head by a bear. He goes on to say, I thought it was a dream for a second. Then the pain hit, and I don't know what's going on. So he said instinctively, he reached up, and he started to punch the bear in the nose and in the eyes repeatedly as it dragged him over 12 feet for the next 15 seconds across the campsite before finally letting go. He goes on to say, fortunately, the injury required just nine staples to his skull. When interviewed, he said, man, I don't know. I am either the luckiest man on earth or I'm the unluckiest man. I, I, don't, I haven't figured it out. And he says, I've survived three big ones. He says, next up on my Instagram, the alligator. And I love that. I just think this guy has such a great perspective. No matter how bad it gets, no matter how you feel, no matter how exhausted, overwhelmed, overworked, tired, cranky, hangry, no matter how you're feeling, trust me, Having a great perspective changes everything, because it can get worse. I want you to, to keep that in mind. Uh, several years ago, uh, Pastor Bill Hybels was leading his church through a, a series in response to asking them questions. And just hearing from his flock, three words kept coming back to him over and over. And it really alarmed him. In fact, he said he was startled. He says, I, we've got to address this. The three words that he kept hearing from his flock were overwhelmed, overscheduled, and exhausted. I'm overwhelmed, I'm overscheduled, I'm exhausted. Anybody ever relate to that? He said as he was talking to his people, people would say, I don't understand what's happening, I'm working harder than ever, but it feels like I'm spinning my wheels. That sounds so familiar. You are not alone. 
Just this week, I was invited to a pastor's gathering with the, the top 20 churches in the area. And, and why they invited me, I don't know. But I was there, and I was loving it. And we were sitting there, and I, as I stopped, I just started looking around the room at these guys. And almost to a man, every single one of them looked exhausted. They looked tired. They weren't in bad shape, but they were tired. You know, and they've been working it. And, and, and here's what they said. They said, you know, retooling, pivoting, and doing this thing and, and trying to keep, keep you know, the flock minister to and stuff. I feel like I'm spending all this sideways energy, whereas I used to have it going forward energy. I knew where I was going, the plan. I have my 12-year plan. I have my five-year plan. I have my two-week plan. All this stuff. All that's gone. It's out the window, and I'm trying to minister remotely, and I want to love these people, but I can't because it's from a distance, and I get close, and they're like, unclean, and I don't know what to do. And, and you feel like you're kind of handcuffed. You're trying to give somebody a hug from across the room. It's just, it's just so weird. You know, I'm not making backwards progress. And at the end of the day, see if you feel like this. I've crossed out a thousand things on my list. My to-do list looks great, but yet I feel like I've made no forward progress. Everything is just sideways energy. So if you've ever felt like that, you're in good company. It is epidemic. And of all the people that Jesus interacts with during his three-year teaching ministry, there's one that stands out to me where he comes and he encounters somebody like this, and he says, whoa, 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 time out. You need to take a break. You are overwhelmed, and you are clearly exhausted. Can anyone guess who this is? I'll give you a hint. It was a close friend of Jesus, and it was a female. Anybody know? Anybody know? There's no shame in it if you don't know. If you already read ahead, you know. Talking about Martha. What I love about this, last week we were in Luke 10. We're going to be there again today, so you can go ahead and open your Bible to Luke 10 or pull up your favorite Bible app. Last week we looked at the Good Samaritan, and we answered the question, who is my neighbor? Who are we called to love? What is this all about? Today we pick right up where we left off, starting in verse 38. And I want to set the context today. I'm going to read probably from the NIV for today. I'm going to change it up on you. We all know that Jesus had hundreds of encounters and hundreds of followers. But what a lot of us don't realize is that he broke that down to 72 inner disciples, or 70, depending on if you're reading the Septuagint or the Masoretic text, whatever. Your Bible may say 70 or 72. And then he broke that down further to 12 core disciples. And we're all familiar with that. We all know about them. But then he narrowed it down again to an inner circle, an inner circle of three, right? Peter, James, and John. But what a lot of people miss is that Jesus had another side circle of close friends, close friends that didn't have the spotlight, didn't get a lot of fame, and they were Mary, Martha, and Lazarus. Mary, Martha, and Lazarus were brother and sister to each other, if you're not familiar with that. And they lived in a little suburb just outside of Jerusalem called Bethany. Not to be confused with Bethlehem, okay? Bethany's like a mile outside. Bethlehem's like five miles outside, okay? So they're in this little suburb, and evidently these three had a guest room that they kept for Jesus. It was so cool because this was like a private place that he could come and get away when he was tired, and he appreciated it deeply. We kind of see that from other texts that hint at this. And the demand on pressures and on Jesus were just growing, and every day he's teaching, more people come to him, more people want healings, more people want him to, to give things to them or show miracles or have this interaction or give them more inspiring messages. And they just kind of want more of everything Jesus can offer. And who can blame them? When Jesus walks by, you know it. And you want to be with him. That's what's awesome about our Lord. He just, he's so amazing in every way. So from time to time, Jesus reaches his limit. And when he does, he calls one of these. He says, time out. I need to get replenished. And this is one of his secret places that he would love to go and find solitude at these little guest quarters. Like a, maybe it's a back room. We don't really know. But these three friends would allow him to wind down, sometimes for a day, sometimes for two days. And he would go, and he would just be with his friends. And that's where we pick up the story. Look with me, starting at verse 38. He says, as Jesus and his disciples were on their way, he came to a village where a woman named Martha opened her home to him. She had a sister called Mary, who sat at the Lord's feet listening to what he was saying. But Martha was distracted by all the preparations that had to be made. She came to him and asked, Lord, don't you care that my sister has left me to do all the work myself? Tell her to help me. Martha, 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 the Lord answered, you're worried, you're upset about so many things, but only one thing is needed. And Mary has chosen the better one, and it will not be taken away from her. All right, so be honest. Remember, it's the potter's hand. This is the beautiful thing. You can take your mask off. Well, not literally, but you can take off, your, you can, you can take off any pretense. You don't have to worry about that. You can be safe here. Can you identify with Martha? You ever been that way where you're the one working your tail off 
and you kind of look over at that person who's not, and you be honest, you resent them a little bit. You're like, some of you are nodding at your spouse. Don't do that. Don't out your spouse right here in public. And you're kind of like, what, what are you doing? Get up here, you lazy bones, and help me. And here we see she comes up and says, Lord, tell him to get up and help me. But Martha's not doing bad things. All right, I'm not here to rebuke her. She's doing good things. But doing the good things has stopped her from doing the best thing, being at the feet of the master. And you can see this coming from a mile away. These dynamics are shaping up. First off, this appears to be an unplanned visit on Jesus' part. There was no RSVP given here that we know of. He just shows up and says, surprise! And I might have 11 or 12 coming after me here. And he shows up, and for some reason, Lazarus doesn't show up here. So maybe he's not here on this day, but he's been teaching, and he's been healing and praying, and you know he's been arguing with his critics, and he just wants to stop by and hang out for some replenishing time with his friends. So Mary pulls up a chair, and I love this. Mary just, I mean, she, she just, she's not shy. She comes up, she says, Jesus, we're so glad you're here. How's it been going? I'm so glad you're here because we have missed you, and we're going to have a great time together. And, I mean, just tell me what, what's been going on. Has it been going good? You've been doing healings? You've been healing people? And, and those Pharisees, they've been hounding you? Are they the worst or what? You know, you could tell us. Because what happens in Bethany stays in Bethany. You're safe here in this little room, right? And they have this talk, and it's, and it's great. And you just, you just love how, how Mar Mary gets this, and she's, she's doing the right thing. And then over here on the other extreme, you see the sister who is night and day doing the opposite of her sister. Martha is frantically trying to tend to the physical needs. Again, not doing bad things. She's doing food and drink and appetizers. There's probably an entree coming. So everything's great, right? Division of labor. One can sit at the feet of Jesus. One can do all the work, right? Everybody's happy? <laughs> not at all. In fact, we see it in the next verse. Martha snaps. Boom, just like that, man. She has had enough. And it is so funny how she handles this, not to judge her, because we've done this too, right? Notice when she's in the kitchen, she's look, you know she's looking at him. She's looking at her sister, you know, and she's, but there's no indication that she's like trying to get her attention, you know? She's not getting her the evil eye. Get in here. There's no stage whisper. What are you? Get in here. I'm in. She's not banging the pots loud, like clink, clink, clink. Whoa, dropped another pot. Hint. None of that. We don't see any of that. She doesn't whisper. She doesn't. What does she do? She marches into the room and interrupts the conversation, right? And she says, hey, you tell her, Lord, don't you care? I don't Notice what's interesting. She doesn't address Mary. She addresses Jesus. Can you imagine? It's like, like she brought the wooden spoon. You know what I'm talking about? Anybody, have, anybody had an encounter with the wooden spoon growing up as a child? We, we called this Mr. No-No. I don't know if you called that. And there was times, you didn't even have to meet Mr. No-No. All you had to do was hold it up. You need Mr. No-No? No, I don't need Mr. No-No. I'll be good. I'll do my algebra, whatever. All right, so I was 17. But still, this is, this is what I picture. She comes out, and she's shaking, and she looks at Jesus and says, Lord, don't you care? Don't you care? Are you kidding me? Think about the audacity of what that statement is. This is Jesus, the one who left heaven's splendor who needed nothing, who in every sense of the word had it made, was enjoying divine fellowship with the Heavenly Father, the Holy Spirit, myriads of angels. It is incredible. This is the one who put on human flesh willingly to come and bleed and die for our redemption. And he's been harangued and been just attacked by all these Pharisees and everything he does, people, it's not enough, and he's exhausted. And here's Martha showing up with the wooden spoon, just saying, don't you care? You're so cold. You're so uncompassionate, Jesus. I don't, I, I don't understand. I mean, where's your love? And where is your mask? Right? Don't you love people? That's not in the story. I added that. But. And, you just, and you know she dropped the bomb. You know she did. In fact, we actually have a photo of it. She looked at him and said, I don't even know who you are anymore. Right? She dropped the boom. She didn't hold back. I don't even know who you are anymore. And then it gets worse. She throws her sister under the bus. She says, Jesus, don't you care that my deadbeat sister has not done it? I added the word deadbeat. Don't you care that my sister has left me to do all the work by myself? And she's just getting warmed up. And I picture her, I just, I, I can't help it. I just picture her with this wooden spoon. Just go, y'all, 
If I was sitting there and some wild woman come out of the kitchen with a wooden spoon in my face, I don't know how this story would end. I'm not, be glad I'm not Jesus, right? I'd be like, kill them all. Just, we're done. We're starting over again, right? But this is not, this is not what Jesus does. Look at his reaction. Like, wild woman comes out with the spoon, and he doesn't retaliate. He doesn't escalate. He doesn't even say, hey, this is so inappropriate. You're talking to, I am the Messiah. I am the son of the living God. Why would you, spoon be gone. I mean, he didn't do any of that. Instead, he simply and gently looks her in the eyes and says her name. Says it a few times. In fact, we actually have a photo of the sisters in the kitchen when he says it. Martha, Martha, Martha. This is a true story right there. Uh, actually, he says her name twice, which in first century Hebrew is like saying, uh, back up, relax, I can tell you're stressed. I have a word for you. And he very kindly says, you are so worried and upset about so many things. Notice that he doesn't accuse her of anything bad. He doesn't rebuke her in front and embarrass. He just makes an observation. And he says, Martha, put down your spoon. Come here for a second. Take a couple deep breaths. I can see you're exhausted. I see you're overwhelmed. There's so many things occupying your mind right now. So many things that have you torn up all inside. Does this sound familiar? Oh, we're talking to somebody. You, you are making my visit so much more complicated than I wanted it to be. I didn't ask for any of this. Oh, oh, Braden knows what I'm talking about. I didn't ask for any of this. He's saying, listen, when I come here, when I stop by, it's basically for friendship. It's basically to get to know you. It's, it's basically to have a, a life-giving, life-exchanging conversation where we can come. Listen, if I wanted a five-star dinner, I could have arranged it. You might have heard about it. I fed 5,000 the other day. In fact, over at a wedding, I made the world's best Chardonnay ever. And if I wanted that, I can arrange for food and drink anytime, anywhere. But what I need and what I want today is to be with you, to lean into each other. And then he quietly drops the truth grenade here. I love this. He pulls the pin of the grenade. And he sets it just gently right down in her lap. And he whispers and he says this. He says, Martha, there's only one thing that's needed. Just one. And your sister's done it. She is doing it. And I am not about to take it away. And I am not about to say, get back in the kitchen, woman, and fix me food. He doesn't do any of that. He's here for the exchange of conversation. And he says, listen, you could go back and do a dozen things in that kitchen. None of the top ten are on my list right there. I don't know why you'd want to do that because your heart, the antidote for all that you are craving right now, is not found in the kitchen. Ooh, man, that's good. That's not one of your notes, but it should be. The antidote for what you are craving, that fear, that tension, that uh, spaz drama, is found at my feet. It is found reclining with Jesus. So come on out here and be with your sister because we're going to talk about how great the Father is. We're going to get our focus on him. We're going to talk about how deep his love is for you. We're going to stop that noise. We're going to stop. We're going to zero in on how amazing God is. And we're going to recalibrate. We're going to get that compass that's way out of whack. We're going to get it aligned with true north. And we're going to just enjoy some life-giving conversation. And that's one of the things I love about this story is where God put it in the Bible. See, what we just read last week, the Good Samaritan, we see that he's saying, look, you need to serve your neighbor. You got to get out there. Wherever there's a need, be active. Get out there. Help them. Don't hold back. But then right here, the very next story in Scripture is the other side of the same coin. So if you're freaked out and you're like, I don't know how to serve my neighbor, it's overwhelming, I don't know how to love it, this is the next part. He's saying this in this story, in all your activism, don't lose sight of the main thing I'm looking for with my followers, and that is a relationship that's unrushed, that is prioritized, that is unhurried. Come sit down with me in the great room. Let's get caught up with each other. Let's enjoy a friendship. See, we're so uncomfortable with that, that idea of friendship, aren't we? You know, we're, we're real comfortable with God loves you. If I say, how many know God loves me? You'd all raise your hand. Now if I say, does God like you? Those hands would kind of come buckle a little bit. Like, well, I think so. I mean, like, I did do that thing the other day we won't talk about. And I should have done that other thing, and I didn't do that. So I kind of think I may be, like, on his naughty list. I'm not really sure. Right? You see what I'm saying? We're real uncomfortable with that. We can't grasp this whole friendship thing. It's so overwhelming to see that the Father not only loves you, but he actually likes you and wants to enjoy friendship and fellowship with you. 
So if you're here today, or you're at home and you're listening, or maybe you're traveling and you've got it tuned in here, let me ask you a very simple question. Do you think pausing and having a sincere conversation, a sincere interaction in an unrushed setting with your Lord, do you think possibly that could help you? Absolutely. You know why? So profound. Because everything your heart is looking for is found at his feet. Everything. Peace, joy, sustaining energy, love, a pause in the grind. All, everything is found right there. You think Jesus knew what he was talking about when he looked at Martha and he said, listen, all this exhaustion, he said, if you will just pull up a chair and sit with me, I can fix this. If you will just pull up a chair right here, I will restore your busy, spastic heart, and I will settle your spirit. In fact, the Greek word that he uses here is merimneo. Merimneo is a fantastic word because it means to have a divided mind. It means to be thinking two thoughts at the same time, a struggle, a straining. So what this implies here is she is so weighed down with the stress and the exhaustion of trying to serve two masters. She's spending all her energy and time doing good things, doing her chores, but she's not being able to spend it with the greatest thing at the feet of the Lord. And it's this divided mind. So let me ask another question. When you find yourself overwhelmed, when you find yourself totally exhausted, what do you do? Notice why I didn't, I didn't say what should you do. When you find yourself in this state, because we all do, what are you doing? What do you do about it? What is your antidote? Like that guy who got bit by the snake in the beginning there. What's your anti-venom to the toxin of this world? What is it you do? Do you plow ahead even harder and get even busier? That's what a lot of us do. Like, oh, well, I'm behind. I'll get further ahead, you know? What do you do when everything seems to be working against you and you are just so stinking drained? Or do you lean into Jesus? Imagine your life is this bucket, okay? You've got full and you've got empty. If I were to ask you right now, where are you on this? All right? If I start here and I st I'm going to lower my finger, you say stop. Like, dee, 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 when I get and nobody said stop, just Milo. Okay, one person's halfway full. The rest of us are here, right? This is where we live. We live here, down where it says empty. And that is no way to live. But this is where the reality is. This is where the rubber meets the road. How full are you right now? So here's the bottom line, Okay. You cannot pour from an empty bucket. You know that? You can't fill other people's cups if yours is empty. You can't. You have to be replenished. But only you are in charge of your replenishment. Your spouse can't replenish you. Your kids can't replenish you. Your pastor can't replenish you. He can't take you to, well, that's, that's on you to get with the Lord. You remember when you're on a plane? What's the first thing they tell you when you get on board? Besides the fact, you'll probably make it. They usually sit there and they go through the, the little vest thing and the blow up thing and they say, should the oxygen mask fall from the ceiling, whose do you put on first? Right, right? They say, put yours on, then assist your children. Right? Because if you're out, ain't nobody going to help the kids. So you've got to do This is the one time that we see Scripture indicating it is okay for some self-care. Because you cannot pour from an empty cup. Just like if you lead people. I'm talking to a lot of leaders now. You can't lead on empty. You can't do it. You can't do it. I can't take you to a place I haven't even been to myself. And it's no one's responsibility to do that except mine. And you know what it feels like when your bucket's full all the way. Man, you're, you're connected with God, you're filled up, you're, you're eating right, you're exercising good, you're sleeping properly, you know, how, how's it feel? A lot of you don't know. <laughs> you're like, I ain't never felt like that. I get it. I get it, especially in these times. When we're full, though, we're at our best. We're thinking clearly, we feel the presence of God more consistently, we feel like, man, I can hear the whispers of the Holy Spirit. 
I'm connected. My prayers have more power. I'm in love with my spouse. I'm loving my family well. I'm leading my home. Man, I'm even loving perfect strangers. I, I even hugged an Auburn fan wearing a Clemson shirt. What, I can love anybody if you can do that. And that's how it is. It's almost like when we are connected with God and we're sitting at his feet, we're reclining with him, we're making that time and we're protecting it. It's almost like we love God and love people. Imagine that. It's almost like we're living life to the fullest as he promised. It's almost like we are living a life with a peace that passes all human understanding the way God was hoping it would be when we stay connected, all right? So that's what it's like when we're full. What about when we're depleted, when you're on empty? How does that feel? What word comes to your mind to describe that? When you're depleted, are you tired? Are you cranky? Are you annoyed with everybody? Are you irritable? Are you hangry? See, in Martha's case, if I had to pick a word, it would be resentment, Martha seems to be resented. Think about this. She comes out of that kitchen. She's shaking that spoon at Jesus. She's shaking it at her sister. And she's saying, Jesus, don't you care? I'm in here working hard. I'm fixing food. I can't order Papa John's. Rabbi John's don't deliver to Bethany. I can't get no food out here. If I don't do this and I'm doing good stuff, what are we doing? You know what? And while I'm on a roll here, your disciples, let's talk about your disciples. Because last time they came, they ate everything. And they're such their moochers. They didn't help with the dishes or nothing. And she's going on and on. And I love this. Jesus just calls a time out here. This is how it is with us. We get so irritated. Be honest. Be honest. Don't, this is awful lonely up here if y'all ain't agreeing with me. The slightest thing can make it a huge deal. The slightest little annoyance. When you were filled up, when you're, when you're living here, slightest little thing, you'll be like, ah, just roll off. No big deal. Let it go. No big deal. But when you're down here, Oh, it don't take much, and it's on like Donkey Kong playing ping pong in Hong Kong. You are going off, and it was such a minute thing, and you're thinking, why did that get on my nerves so much? You know why? Because we weren't connected to Jesus. We were in our flesh, and we were doing our own thing, and we were busy, too busy to spend time at his feet, and maybe you were busy doing good things, but we neglected the greatest thing, resentment. You ever felt that way? That's what Martha was dealing with here. Everything was getting on our nerves. So when we're depleted, some of us, man, we withdraw. Right? If I haven't named your characteristic yet, I will. Some of us shut down, right? Why are you so quiet? Why are you angry? I'm, not doing, I, I, I'm just shutting down. <laughs> this is me shutting down. You won't get to me. I put up my wall. <laughs> not getting to me. Some of you are, don't point to your spouse. Don't do that. You don't have to out them. Some of you turn to other things. We overeat. And we're depleted, right? We overdrink. We overmedicate. Some of us, when we're depleted, and this is why I fall into this, when we're depleted, we put our head down, we furrow our brow, we get more intense, and we work like a rabid hyena on steroids who has way too much caffeine. In fact, we have a photo, an actual photo of me in this state. This is me <laughs> right here, true photo, last week. I had more hair. This is what a lot of us do. Would anyone else work like just throw yourself into work more and you get more intense? Like, you know what will help this situation? I'm going to shift into a higher gear. I'm going to redline the RPM. That'll help. I'm going to spin these plates doo -doo -doo -doo, on this stick. I'm going to spin them even harder. I'm going to go crazy. And then your kids and your wife and your people and your staff looking at you like, <laughs> are you okay? <laughs> I think you're going to explode. And we don't look like Jesus. You know, we make things so much more complicated than we ought to be. And Jesus shows up and says, would you please just come sit? Some of us say, no, 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 Jesus, I appreciate that. You don't understand. I've got some retail therapy that's going to help me. I'm going to take my credit cards and I'm going to go, yeah, I'm sad right now. But look, now I'm sad, but I have a fabulous outfit. It's fantastic. And we're no better than we were. In fact, we're worse because now we're in debt. We think Amazon, surfing it up and having 18 packages show up the next day with pride, is going to somehow numb us. But that does not get to the root. And just like Martha wasn't having her best day, none of these ways we live and we're depleted lead to us being better. And I love it when we pause, we get with God, and he says, beloved child, hear me. Put down your spoon. Put down your spoon. Come out of the kitchen. Come out of your cubicle. Come out of your man cave, wherever. Come here and be with me. Recline with me. Lean in. I, I met with my staff on Monday. And I looked around, and you know, I had all these agendas. I had my two-year goals and all this stuff. You know, I, just, I didn't even open my calendar. 
I just looked at him and said, guys, you know what I hear God saying to me during these days? Lean in to Jesus. Lean in. It's the only way you're going to be centered. It's the only way you're going to show peace in a, in a world that's losing its collective mind. <laughs> Lean into Jesus. Lean toward the source of help. Put down the spoon. Okay, so my challenge is twofold this week. The first one is that. Lean into Jesus more this week, not less. Lean toward the source that can help you, not away from it. And the second one, and this is where it's going to be kind of fun for you, I want you to ask yourself, what can I do? How do I identify new streams that replenish me? New streams that actually pour back into my bucket. What are those streams? And this is where you have some fun. I want you to do this this afternoon, or maybe tonight, get with your family, get with your kids, get with your spouse, and say, when do you see me at my best? When do you see me most relaxed? When do you see me when I'm most fun to be around? Mm -hmm. And buckle up, because your family's going to be honest. They're going to tell you. They know. <laughs> they know when you're depleted and when you're full. They're going to give you some help. You know, and, and you know what? Just think, we're going to have some fun with this. You know, I used to do this, and I remember when I did that, I would feel this. I would feel this. You've already leaned into Jesus. Now you need to find some way to have that replenishing. Jesus liked to hang out with some friends. They like to pause, you know. What are those things? Maybe, hey, I should try this. Or, hey, you know, I remember, honey, when you used to do this. You tried this before, and you get all these ideas bubbling up. You can have some fun. Man, run with it. Have fun. Brainstorm. Find something. You know what my, one of my safety valves was that I could let off steam? I used to be able to go sneak away once a week and disappear for two hours and watch a movie and have food brought to me. I can't do that right now. And I get a little itchy. I get a little twitch in my eye, and I'm just like, Ehh! because I used to be able to go to AMC and sit there and have them bring my chicken fingers and my large Diet Coke that they would refill three times. Well, what do you do when your hobby's taken? You've got to find new ways to replenish so that when you come home, you don't kick the dog. It's not the dog's fault. It's not your kid's fault. Only you take responsibility for that. It's not your family's thing, okay? You take responsibility to identify those. What is it that would take you from depleted to full. As you start talking about this, you're going to see some things, man. It is going to be so much fun. And you're going to get back on track, and you're going to stay on track, because you're going to start sensing, you know what, I'm, I'm doing it again. And if you don't know it, your spouse will tell your kids, hey, you're, you're, you're down here. What can you do? How do you replenish? You need to go find Mary and Martha's house. You need to go sit for a little bit. Maybe you just need to go sit at the feet of the master. Maybe you've been neglecting your quiet time. Maybe you haven't been reading your, your word and spending time. Maybe you've been skipping out on church how could you it happens no guilt no shame if you're falling off the horse just get back on the horse and ride you know we we, we need you well we, we're all in the same storm together so that's my homework for for you okay that that's your that's your challenge today what we're going to do is we're going to um, end a little differently my mic's still on i'm going to end a little differently what we're going to do i'm going to have my helpers come up go ahead and do that and mr eric come up here buddy I want to I wanna talk. Some of you know about this, but uh, if you haven't heard, there have been some exciting news that, that are you okay to get close? Are we, are we allowed to do this? Okay, all right, we're doing this. They had, not that close, that's weird. All right. We uh, love this guy. Been with me for years. Sometime in February or March, right before the pandemic hit, Eric came up and he said, hey, listen, we've got some exciting news. God has opened up some doors way out west, like Winston-Salem area, right, right, right? And uh, his wife got an awesome promotion, I believe going to be teaching at a very respected, awesome ballet school that, that is doing killer and great things and uh, has survived the pandemic well. Eric's going to be looking for some things out there as well. But they are going to be moving, all right? Now, if you didn't get this memo way back in February or March, don't feel bad because as soon as this was announced, the pandemic hit <laughs> and everything shut down, so it kind of got lost. But your kids might have known about this, but we've been praying about this for months, and they're going to be here for a little bit longer, so you don't have to like inundate them today. But before they hop town or secretly try to quietly and humbly disappear, I wanted to embarrass him uh, and, and his wife. You can come up here too, Christina. I know you hate being in front of people. Let's, let's just make it a family thing. She can, you, and, you, you can embarrass her. <laughs> I, I like I it. So what we want to do is we want to pray for them because God has some exciting stuff in store for them. Their future is so bright and and. While it's bittersweet to ever see a friend go, I think it's awesome what God's doing. You have our 100% support. We're proud of you. We love you. We respect you. And I want to thank you on behalf of a church. All kidding aside, thank you. Thank you both for pouring 
your life into our kids for years and years. You've done awesome. I've seen the change just in my own family. And uh, we have a couple things for you, Mary. You want to bring something up here? This is, uh, you can open this later if you want. It's not explosive. And there's something in there that will help you remember us forever. A very, very cool thing. And this is just a, a, just a little token of our appreciation. These balloons were 100% full and looking awesome. But when they got in the cold, they kind of <laughs> shrunk up and, and had a, a bizarre thing. So I promise um, we love you guys and we appreciate you. I know it's a weird season. That if, if they don't feel comfortable hugging and, and crying on you guys, give them an air hug or something. But here's what I want to do today. I want to pray a blessing for them. And I want to just thank them. And I hope you can. They're not leaving today. They're going to be here Wednesday night. They're going to be teaching. And for the next few days, um, send them a card. Maybe contact them and see if you can take them out to eat. And just show them some love. Because um, this is a strange time to be in right now. But we don't want them to feel that they're falling through the cracks. Because we do love and value them. So here's what we're going to do. Would you stand right where you are? If you're at home, just reach your hand toward the TV as we unite our hearts. I want to pray for Christina and for Eric. And uh, just ask the Lord to shower his favor on them. God, I thank you so much for the Bartons. I thank you for their friendship. But more importantly, I thank them for their, their loyalty to you and the way they serve you and the way they love you, the way they radiate peace, even when so many crazy things happen. God, I thank you for their steadfastness in you. And Lord, I'm praying that you would bless them with good health, with, with awesome friends. I pray that you would surround them with godly people who bring them up and encourage them in these new journeys. I pray that you would smooth out the road and fill in potholes spiritually, that you would keep the devil away from them. Lord, I pray you would put your armor on them from head to toe and that you would protect their finances and their testimony and all their comings and goings. Lord, they've been so good to us. I pray you would continue to be so good to them. We love them and you love them even more. We trust them into your care now. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. 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 God bless you guys. Love you. <laughs> love you, buddy. <laughs> Are you, are you huggable? Are we, are we, are we, okay. Awesome. Love you guys. Have a great one.